one song, and then we're going to have a psalm reading, and then we're going to go ahead and do into the getting to the sermon tonight as well. We'll start with the whiter and snow song again. It's a new one for us. Lord Jesus, I Behold, God is my salvation, I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. Therefore with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. And in that day shall ye say, Praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his doings among the people, make mention that his name is exalted, sing unto the Lord, for he hath done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, 
Thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. So we're going to look at a few different things here. A lot of the different uh, things that just came to me as I'm just meditating throughout the week. And uh, just crying out to God this weekend. Uh, I guess yesterday went out to the mountain again. It's going to be trying to make my weeks a little bit more systematic. And it uh, seems the Lord is making it clear that I'm going to try. He's, he really wants me to focus on the house church. Um, there's always different things I'm trying to work on all the time. So it feels like i got a lot of irons in the fire everywhere. So it's hard to... Um, it's hard to give everything to certain things, but I feel like that's like one of the most important things for me right now is to just really pour into the house church, and just to work at the home, work at the yard, and work in everything, just taking care of everything that's necessary to make it plausible for um, some of the new people that are going to be coming here eventually. So getting to know the neighbors, getting to know people everywhere, and having that be a bigger focus, which is not normal, because usually I don't I don't try to invite people to the church because it's always hard to have new faces in the church when they don't know how we do things and trying to readjust for people who just want to just visit which is it just it's not it's not as easy as it looks it's hard it's actually hard to have new faces who are not really invested so I haven't coming up with an idea of like how to kind of implement new faces and to show them kind of what the vision is and what we really want to see happen for the time that we are here so that it's not aimless there's nothing aimless about this house church and it never was meant to look that way but to be able to learn how to be as strong as we can in godliness and to be able to be as maximized in his strength for all that he has for us to do and so whether people are going to be here for a long time or short time but while we're here it it must be a very isaiah 6 experience it must be a very throne room uh dreadful majesty type of a church um, a lot of really precious things that have to happen in other churches, and they're they're doing a good job. But in here, it's um, it's always one um, to leave the fear factor on high high gear, and to be able to look at um, all the different things the Lord puts on my heart as I'm as I'm seeking Him all week long, all the time. And so, uh, I didn't I actually didn't mean to have a the, the main um, thought on the screen right there, but I guess it's on there, which is fine. Looking at the five main problems I was hanging out with um, some other Christians this week it just happens to be that the ones I seem to click with the most are the Church of Christ people who I have um, some differences with but it feels like really good because I can I feel like I can be myself more um, around them because the doctrine is so so similar coming from the holiness movement I'm pretty sure like the Nazarenes and the Church of Christ and um, the Methodists and I think a few others they did have their roots in some of the evangelical awakenings and what have you, some historical monuments in history of church history. And uh, it's very hard to find churches that have midweek services. And if they are a service, it's usually like a kid thing or something that's just doesn't, it's not plausible. So it's amazing how that seems to be the only one popping up in anywhere near here for the most part. But uh, so that's why I chanced it, and it was actually really, really fun. Um, hearing the wisdom from the different people, but one of the things that I was doing because they have it like it's basically like a Bible study where they go through a passage and then the teacher is saying his, saying his part and everybody else can raise their hand and say a little something as well and it kind of brought me up to that thought about like um, about unification among the brethren about staying in love with the brother brothers and sisters staying in love and keeping your hearts together in love so the deceptions that are going to be taking off a lot of Christians by storm because they're not going to stay in love and they're going to have a heart that will not be able to perceive God for who he is and that's what you saw in Colossians they had a lot of issues a lot of the churches had a lot of issues and so um, I've, I've tried to I try to break it down into the five main things that, I, that pop up to me um, there could be other ones that you could break it down in different ways I'm sure but this is one really good way to do it to sum up a pretty vast uh, view on the uh, the main issues that you see continually coming up that um, the apostles are dealing with the churches in the New Testament. And so um, you can see the first one is Gnosticism because there's a lot of super twisted views um, all the way back to while the apostles were still alive. Twisting the views and paganizing them to a very considerable um, a degree that they definitely were not preaching Christianity. They're just taking titles and phrases and names and dates and what have you from Christianity and applying it to that which is already paganism 
and uh, uh, philosophers that had gone on um, even before Christ even came on earth, namely uh, Plato. Plato was the one that is a uh, one that has been, I mean, just demented doctrines, which we're going to look at some of these things. One called a Neo Platonism, Neo Platonism, which is something that you'd see Gnosticism eventually turning into. But there was a lot of roots in these kinds of things, and they just, they're not, they're hard to define because. It's like defining a Christian, and one's like, I don't believe in that, I don't believe in that, and they all have their different views. Well, among good Christians, there's different views, and among good Gnostics, good, good, terrible people, doctrine, terrible, horrible, that horrible doctrines, there's differences there as well. So we're going to look at some definitions. So um, it'll be a little bit educational today, more than just the flow, like I'd like to get into, because I really want us to learn this stuff. So um, I just have a few pages of notes and some ideas that I'm going to try to blend together with um, the main view of looking at the five main problems that you see the apostles dealing with throughout the New Testament, plain and simple. And the second one was sexual sins. The third one, useless divisions, where they're not in love. That's the one I thought of when I was talking with these folks. Um, and idolizing the law or idolizing gifts, you know, things that are getting out of whack, like Zach Poon was talking about how the, uh, if you look at all that's matter of the faith, not the body of Christ, but kind of like the body of all the focus of the, of the church, the things that we're supposed to be doing and focusing on, and you take the spiritual gifts and call that the finger of um, the whole body of, of everything. And some people m magnify that so much that that finger is like 20 feet long, which is ridiculous. And other people say, oh, it's terrible, let's just chop the whole thing right off. And that's off, off, awfully ridiculous as well. So um, this is the one that's just trying to say, just keep it all in order, keep, it in, keep everything in time with what God is doing right now. And so we can know how to see um, the Gnostic doctrines and to find out where are they coming in today because there's a lot of them. And whether it's doctrinal um, occultism or it is, uh, um, it's either doctrinal or spiritual occultism because there's a lot of people out there that preach a lot of sound doctrine but the way that they carry things out is occultic, which is really tricky. It's, it's really scary because some of the, some of the better teachers, they come from like the charismatic movement. Some of the things they teach is just phenomenal. Some of it's terrible. A lot of it is, but at the same time, there's a lot of very, very good sound doctrine that matches really, really good with a lot of the holiness things and some of the really old of the best in Christianity. But the way that they carry them out and the manifestations that happen is where you have the problem with. So it's the way that they believe and the way that they practice. They believe right, but they practice wrong. And so we want to be able to dissect these things so when you see them popping up and say, that doesn't sound right, you know. Like last week we were, you know, crucifying the, uh, no, uh, the dispensationalist doctrine because there's, they twist scripture like Gnosticism does. They twist it to make Christianity impossible to happen because Christianity was never meant to be just a belief. And my opinion is this, and my opinion is this. All these opinions don't add up to anything if that person's will does not end up going into God's hands for him to direct that person. Because until that happens, all Christianity is for that soul is just a belief of them in their flesh trying to be religious, them in their flesh trying to carry out morality and their own ideas. And there is a lot of merit to that. And that little bit of merit compared to the real power of the cross has carried a lot of Christians for over 2,000 years considering them to be born again people and their will really has not been truly given over to the Lord. And they really haven't been crucified. So death to self is death to our will. And until our will is truly on the altar, the only thing that we really do own is our will. Everything else is going to come and go with the very short time we're here. The Bible says that we're just a vapor. While we're just a vapor popping up and we grab all these things, we think we own them, but we don't because when we die, we're not going to take anything with us uh, from the dust we came and from the dust we shall return. And if we take a look at that, we're going to, we're going to be able to put things into perspective and not allow inc incredibly horrifying doctrines to come. So we'll be looking at these things um, pretty, pretty reasonably detailed, not too much. But it's not going to be like a college class or anything like that, but enough to get a pretty decent handle on the, the horrifying reality of Gnosticism. Sexual sins is not that hard to touch on. We already know about those various things that we've seen in the Old and New Testament, which I believe is a capital punishment to God. I believe that it will capsize your faith. Sexual sin will capsize your faith. And no, I don't believe that sexual sin will make heaven. I believe pornography, fornication, adultery and homosexuality, anything related to any of the sexual perversion, anything outside of a one-man, one-woman marriage, 
uh, before you're married, after marriage, all this stuff is, is very, very dangerous. All sexual, sexual sins has got to be absolutely abolished. Even the hint of it needs to be abolished from the body of Christ because a little bit of a compromise takes you a lot further than you probably think. Useless divisions, um, which is a love thing. Idolizing the law, people getting back to the letter instead of in the spirit, they start in grace, the grace of God, to, to bring you into the righteousness of God legitimately, relationally, and then going back to these things and starting to make laws that don't really add up to the life of the spirit. It's, it's also false. Idolizing the gifts, like we said, is also very false. So you can see these things broken down in a lot of ways, but mostly we're going to be talking about number one because that's the main thing here. So a lot of different things I'm going to kind of run through, but I'm going to mostly run through this. And then we'll run through some of the other little little thoughts. There's actually quite a few uh, really interesting things that kind of continue to add to the arsenal of the holiness position on a lot of different things. You know, whether um, I was thinking about this one too, I'll kind of give you a hint that real quick about like years ago before I ever preached at all, I was always wondering like, God, I know you call me to preach, but I literally couldn't imagine standing in front of anybody at all and actually doing it. And I actually tried one time and it was so much pressure. The week before I actually did it, I was under bone crushing pressure. I couldn't think, I could barely breathe. Everything felt like death and blackness to me. I couldn't even believe the pressure. I said, God, I'll, I don't know how anybody could do this. And I looked at all these people I made fun of all the time on stage and I said, wow, you're so cool. I don't know how you do it. Because then I realized what it felt like to be sitting on the other side of that pulpit. But uh, I said, God, how do you do that? And it's like, and then literally one time he showed me and he put something in my in, in inside of me and just says, as long as that's there, you can just preach. It's just it's just who you are now. I just make it so yeah, that's who you are. It's like he can put it in you and you can take it out. And it's like an act of, you know, like a candle that's lit and it just goes or it doesn't do anything. He can work in his, your will to do his will. Or he can... Um, um, he, can, he can work into you to preach, he can work into you to overcome, and all these different things are all accompanying the salvation that God did pay for on the cross through His Son, um, through the cross of Jesus Christ. All these things were purchased, not just coming into the faith, but there's a lot of assumptions that come with it too. Like I believe the baptism of water is an assumption. You're going to get baptized, you're going to want to show the world, this is what happened, I've been, I've been renewed, I gave my only thing that I own, my will and my sin to God, and uh, the, the way I can handle things in my life, there's a lot of things I can, uh, I can uh, govern for temporarily because I'm only going to be here for 75-ish years. And while I'm here, I have temporary uh, entrustments to, to take care of the little or a lot that God has given me, and I want to give a good account. So I gave everything to the Lord, and I know that He has washed me in His blood. I know His Spirit was within me, and I know just by what He has shown me thus far that there's a lot more to go. So there's a lot of assumptions that you, the new life was going to call you to. I want to be baptized. I want to live righteously. I want to be around strong Christians. I want to be under strong leadership, people who are men of prayer. I want to be under good counsel. I want to be in the safety of a multitude of counselors. I want to hear the best kind of preaching that there ever was. I want to know how to do it right. I want to be safe because I realize, whoa, the new life. And I go back to my school and everything felt so wrong. Like, whoa, this is going to be hard to protect. Got all these different mindsets around me that's going to try to conflict with my new life. And I don't know how I'm going to handle this. This is really hard, Lord. And so you're realizing I, I'm going to have to live and abide in faith. I'm going to have to learn how to pray. I'm going to have to learn how to keep my mind stayed upon God that he can keep me at perfect peace. There's a lot of things that you're just assuming that's going to come with salvation, including baptism, including possibly speaking in tongues and things like this. Later on, we don't always know how God's going to work it out, but these are the assumptions of how you're going to want to get into things that you're going to have new wantings and new not wantings that are going to come with your new life. They're all assumptions. They're all things that are assumed will come and they ought to come. Amen. So we're going to look at some of these uh, things at the, at, towards the end a little bit more. But uh, as we're looking at these guys right here, um, we can see the main things, and we're going to start to break them down a little bit further. I'll even show you some dictionary definitions as well here. Um, we'll go back to that one in just a second. We'll start with the top one. So Gnosticism is the first one. And so it says right here, the Gnostic, it says it's, uh, it, the word is Gnosis. So the word Gnostic, whenever you think of that, think of it, the word knowledge. And um, that is kind of what... Um, you can start, I'm going to show you several different points to Gnosticism alone. And this is from the 1828 dictionary, so it's actually not a new thing. So it's not like it's a far-fetched thing that the Bible was trying to make up something or people saying, oh, the Nicolaitans, they weren't really Gnostics. It wasn't just the Nicolaitans. There's obviously a lot of uh, folks that were uh, 
dealing with the extremely twisted versions of Christianity. So here's what it says. The Gnostics were a sect of philosophers that arose in the first ages of Christianity who pretended they were the only men who had true knowledge of Christian religion, of the Christian religion. They formed, themsel formed for themselves a system of theology agreeable to the philosophy of Pythagoras, or is it called the Pythagoras, I forgot how she said it, um, Pythagoras, and Plato. So I don't know who that first one is. I think we've all heard of Plato, more of a more popular uh, philosopher, to which they accom accommodated their interpretations of Scripture. So you're going to take what the Bible says to watch out for. The Bible says to watch out for um, philosophy, and especially if it's pagan philosophy. I mean, all philosophy, for the most part, unless it's Christian for real, is going to be pagan. But this is blatant pagan philosophy. They use in those eyes, they use those glasses to interpret Scripture. My dear friend, that's crazy. They held that all natures, intelligible, intellectual, and material, are deprived from successive emanations from the infinite fountain of deity. These emanations they called eons, or something like, I can't even see the word there exactly. These doctrines were derived from the Oriental philosophy, Gnostic pertaining to the Gnostics and the, or their doctrines. Um, Gnosticism, the doctrines, principles, or system of philosophy taught by the Gnostics. Okay, so we're getting a little bit into there. It's a lot to know. This is one from the book, um, it, it's uh, Evidences of Eternal Life from Parish Reedhead. What are we dealing with here? The heresy, John, in the book of, uh, when he's writing that, the, the five pieces, first and second, third, John, uh, the first chapter, or five chapters, mostly dealing with Gnosticism, as a lot of the folks were. And he was talking about, you know, he says that we know that the Antichrist shall come, and um, but there are many Antichrists that have come. And he says, if they ever say that Christ has not been raised again in bodily form, that is Antichrist. Why did he say that? Because he was trying to make sure that people saw the real truth and to be able to uh, differentiate between uh, the true gospel of Jesus Christ and the false gospel of Gnosticism, which takes many different forms, as we're going to see. Gnosticism is a belief that attempts to separate God from his creation, especially man, uh, especially from man, and to erase man's responsibility. Okay, right there, you could sum up everything right there and to erase man's responsibility to act in a moral, rational manner toward God and other people. Okay, So if you want to take what God has to say according to his word, we do have a moral responsibility to aim at his law, to aim at his standards, and to live that way before God and all the good of the universe. That is what Charles Finney's standard is. We as human beings have to strive to focus, to avoid temptation, to live righteously on purpose, and to live for the glory of God and the good of the universe. So that's exactly opposite of Gnosticism, taking away that moral standard. It is a system of extremes. It leaves the door wide open for people to gra gratify any physical desire they can think of. On the opposite end of the scale, some of the followers involve themselves in excessive practices designed to mortify the body. Gnosticism contains elements taken from other religious systems. It is espoused by people who say that they have a higher knowledge, another revelation above and beyond and other than the revelation of scripture. The Gnostics claim that salvation is attainable only by those whose faith enables them to transcend matter. Intellig intelligent sectarians, the people in the Apost uh, Apostle John's day were influenced by popular philosophers and scientists. It is so today. The doctrine advocated by the Gnostics is a totally different erroneous, satanically generated cheap substitute for the grace of God. There is no revelation higher than God. He is the only source of understanding. There is no revelation higher than Jesus Christ. Okay, so that's that was the one. That's Gnosticism. Here's the next one called dualism. Uh, dualism, a basic tenet of Gnosticism is satanic is the satanic doctrine that says all matter was created by Satan and only spirit was created by God. Therefore only spirit is good all matter is bad. The earth is bad, the body is bad, the appetites are all bad, and so on. But God, you, but God, you re will recall, pronounced his creation, including the body, good. Amen. So that's just the first chapter alone would prove that dualism is a total damnable heresy that will, and, and it's really scary. I've actually seen a movie, I'll tell you about it real quick. It was called uh, Sudi and Simpson. 
and it was taking place, I think probably a lot back in the day, probably around in the 1800s, back when slavery and racism was so prominent in some of the you know country areas and a lot of places. Um, but it was uh, a situation where um, they taught that the body was sin and that your your body was sin. That no, everything your body was just sin, no matter what. And um, that there was a guy who was getting away with doing really bad things to the young ladies there in the in the community, and. And, it, and they, the girls didn't think anything. They they didn't feel like feel like they had any way to stand against it because they figured, well, my body is just sin anyway that I can't really stand against it. And so nobody did until the little one of the kind of the more outspoken girls finally had the guts to say something and got the guy thrown in jail. But uh, what I'm saying is that it has just so people say, well, that doesn't really matter. It doesn't have anything to do with salvation. It's not true. One little thing goes wrong in your doctrine. When you actually behold the glory of God, when you actually give your will to God, you've actually been a, the blood has been applied, you actually are blessed, you actually are transformed by the power of God with a new wanting of doing everything right for God and rejecting all the things that God hates. One little thing off can, could make it, it could stop you or slow you down or make it impossible for you to be born again. So I don't believe that little things like that don't matter. They matter a lot. And in this situation, you could see that that was like they made a movie about it because it was such a normal thing. Because um, hurting children is such a normal thing in this nation, which is absolutely unacceptable. Here is a logical continuation of the matter. Uh, of, the, of the matter is bad, spirit is good lie. Taught by the Gnostics. Because man sinned, he was put into prison, and that prison was his body. Since man is in a body and the body is matter, it doesn't make any difference what man does in that body because the body has no, no moral significance at all. Therefore, a person can go right on living in darkness and still claim to be a follower of Christ, claiming to have fellowship with God. Now look what Satan has done. Listen to his lies. He said that he created, but only God created. He said matter is bad when God said matter is good. <laughs> Amen. So let me actually go further. This is the other one called antinomianism. Um, antinomian is uh, anti, which uh, whenever you think of anti, you've got to think number primarily it's against. Don't think of it as another. That's a that's a that's a lie that a lot of people use for the, another Christ, or they say the antichrist is just another Christ. And he is another Christ in a sense, but at most of all, he's against the true Christ. He's diametrically opposed to all that the real Christ is all for. So anti noma is anti-law. So you have a law, a lawless life, which Jesus says you're going to go to hell. He says, depart from me, you curse it for you, for those that live as though there's no law, lawless ones, against the law, pertaining to the antinomians, one of the sect who maintain that under the gospel dispensation, the law is of no use or obligation, or who hold doctrines which supersede the necess necessity of good works and a virtuous life. Okay, they don't think you have to live a good life. They think you just are fine like all the other all satanic doctrines are. This sect originated with John Agricola about the year of 1538. Wow. Antinomianism, the tenets of antinomians, antinomist, one who pays or regard the law, uh, or pays no regard to the law or good works. Okay, so obviously to not live by... The standards of godliness is a really, really big problem. Now, dualism is another one that we just looked at um, in the dictionary. It actually kind of touches on it a little bit. Actually, better than I even suspected. It's pretty con good considering it's a, a couple hundred years old, and I was happy that it even got in there at all. So the first one is just kind of talking about the word dual because it's two. Expressing the number two as a dual number in Greek. That's all it is. Dual just means number two. T dualistic, consisting of two, um, the dualistic system of Anna Zogaris and Plato. So that name, I'm having a suspicion that that's the same person that we saw earlier, something Garaz, the, the P, P word, um, and I think it's the same person. It's, or it's a very similar name, and it just happens to be there again, so it's not hard to believe that it's the same person. So um, that Plato taught that there are two principles in nature, one active and the other passive. Okay, so... Dualism is ultimately teaching a very false doctrine. Gnosticism, we saw that one. One more thing, I'll just go ahead and show you this one here. Neoplatonism, you'll see a similarity here. And you can definitely see how you could see how these compromised doctrines led to what we see today as Luciferianism. And it's not hard to believe at all. I mean they're basically teaching the same thing, but they just make it like they're trying to promote Jesus. But a Luciferian is more definite 
So this is like a stair step from Gnosticism, of compromised Christianity, all the way to all this dualism, antinomianism, neoplatonism, and then out straight up to Luciferianism, where they actually believe that God was taken off his throne and replaced by the true light, Lucifer, which is absolutely, unbelievably horrible. Uh, Neoplatonism, the term is often applied to movements during the Middle Ages and Renaissance that were informed by Neoplatonic -Plato doctrines. All Neoplatonists, regardless of religious orientation, shared a belief in the superior quality of immaterial reality and regarded Plato as the greatest of ancient philosophers. So there was an immaterial reality that they were uh, looking at, so like a superior quality of spiritual knowledge in a sense, and Plato was the giant of the whole thing. So there, there was a philosophy that he has that he would try to m uh, implement with the Christian doctrine which we know as Gnosticism of the Bible, or the Nicolaitans that you saw in the chapter 2 of Revelation, that Jesus says he hates the doctrines and he hates the deeds. Why? Because it's a sinful doctrine and a sinful way that it ends up believing. So the way you believe, obviously, according to Jesus, it matters a lot. Neoplatonists believe human perfection and happiness were attainable in this world without awaiting an afterlife. Perfection and happiness seen as synonymous could be achieved through philosophical contemplation. All people return to the One from which they uh, eman emanated, from the, which they em emanated. So there you go, folks. That's uh, the main issue right there. Those are the things that we see here. And you'll see that these kinds of doctrines that call us to not be faithful to God is, is very prominent today. Um, I've come against the Baptist church a lot. Even Baptists have come against the Baptist church because there are Baptists that are really saved. Um, Paul Washer is like a Spurgeonist Baptist or Calvinist Baptist or something like that, which actually gives credit to things that I usually despise. But when those things are not watched over under a very holy light, they will turn into something that is identical to Gnosticism. They will turn into the same thing where you just don't feel like you need to worry about those things. You say, well, I don't believe that. I, 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 we're saying the same thing. I've been changed. I'm living righteously. I'm like, my friend. The fear of God for someone who believes that they can turn away from the Lord is not the same as someone who thinks that they can't turn away from the Lord. Someone who says that they can't turn away from the Lord, it's amazing the, the depth of the way they pray. You can feel it. They don't, have, they, don't, they don't care the same. It's like you believe something that's causing you to have that same Gnostic spirit. So Baptists, Reformers, Calvinists, this kind of thing I feel with them, it's very, it feels very, it's hard to pray, it's hard to get intimate with the Lord, it's hard to be like that, because they just don't feel like they care. They're just like, well, don't worry about it, it's all been paid for. They have this real casual attitude towards it, and I think that's very, very dangerous. So, look at the other ones below there, you can see the, the sins there, sexual sins, fornication, divorce and remarriage, which you know I'm not against remarriage. I've, I've taken that doctrine a little bit further. Not to get too off topic, but it's it's a really big deal because there's a lot of people who are in bondage thinking they can't be remarried because they think it's adultery. And I'm here to say that anybody who has had sex before you got married is no better shoes at all. At all. Um, all of those were capital punishment in the Old Testament, and that's exactly the law that Jesus was preaching. That was one of the issues is that people were not taking marriage for serious. They were not taking it seriously. They were taking it as though it was a license to just live like fools. And that's what I, that's why they were constantly dealing with it, saying the way you're doing it is like is 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 adultery. You guys have an adulterous spirit. Someone who is born again, they may have already been married, but you don't have an adulterous spirit anymore because God gave you his spirit and you want to live righteously and you're saying, Lord, whatever you want. If you want me to be single or you want me to be married, I'm gonna do your will, whatever you say to me, because you're the you're the shepherd and you speak to your real sheep and that would be me. And you're going to be the one that tells me what it is. And he's going to be the one too. And that, so that you can look at it under this light, and it will, it will relieve a lot of people from having to think that these people are, oh, you're not looking at it right. No, you're not looking at the whole Bible. You need to look at the whole Word of God and stop, and stop quoting things as though you don't know the whole counsel of God. You shouldn't be uh, putting that much pressure on people when you don't know the whole counsel of God. So useless divisions, keep in love so you can keep your focus on God as he is. That's what happened to the Colossi Church. Keep your eyes on this, uh, the mystery of God, the Father, and the Son. He's clearly talking about the triune Godhead and Colossians. There's going to be deception coming. If you want to avoid it and keep your heart sound in God, keep your eyes on God as He is, and keep in love with your church. Stay in love with each other, and you can't fail. That's what spiritual warfare is mostly about. I mean, you keep it in line. Everybody keeps, keeps your place. Don't get prideful. Don't divide over nothing. And the devil cannot get his foot in the door. He won't have a foothold in that, state, in that church. Uh, idolizing gifts like we already talked. So we got those things down. The main problems there, good deal. 
So let's look at some more thoughts here. You can have a nice easy word tonight, but still very, very serious as we all are going there. Oh, with certain things you are connected to, uh, you're connect, uh, with certain things you're connected to, you're connected to everything that they're connected to. Amen. So I was thinking about that this, this, this week as I was thinking about people who want to come to Jesus and they want to take the salvation part, they want to take the forgiveness part, but they don't want to take his yoke upon them and they don't want to take, they don't want to bear the reproach of the cross. All they want is what they want from Jesus, but they don't want all of Jesus. But I'm saying all of Jesus is his word. All his Jesus is God and all his commandments. It is not just forgiveness. It's a new life of righteousness in Christ where he removes your will. He moves your desires eventually, takes your life and changes it. He works his will into your life and makes it so you can love living righteously because that's what God has made you to be. Um, some people have come into my life back in the day and they, you know, back when I first got saved, I was so excited about God, so it drew some attention and people would say that they wanted me to be their teacher or whatever and that wasn't the final goal because I was their teacher and as soon as I started teaching other people, they got very angry and so I realized, I was like, okay, I gotta, I gotta get some wisdom here and start to learn how to, how to have my boundaries in certain situations. But, um, everybody, everybody has to be able to take more than just, uh, more than just the part that they want. There's, there's a sacrifice of of the faith as well there's going to be something about what you there's always a trade-off when you come to the real jesus you're going to be losing something that you shouldn't have had anyway you shouldn't have been reveling in or living in anyhow and so we have to um take both sides of the coin we can't just take one side people like to they, they want to they want to connect with me sometimes but as soon as they start to learn about what i have to sacrifice and they realize that i'm telling them that they have to do the same they start to gravitate away and act like i and like and say things about me that isn't true um, some come to Jesus for what he offers, but when they see the parts where, they, where the cross is too heavy, they also leave. So um, I believe that this is something that happens. People, sometimes they don't want to leave Jesus because they know that this is true. They love going to church. It's been part of their culture. So they allow themselves to go to where their ears are going to get tick itchy. Itchy ears are going to get tickled. They can get told what they want and end up looking like these things that the apostles warned. And some of those warnings that like we talked about before is extremely serious, especially when they get going too far. Um, one of the main things I wanted to do when I first got saved is to ask a lot of Christians what they think about certain certain things um, and find out what people think. Like, what do you think about the Bible? And when they answer, I'd be like, that's way off. And then I'd find some answers to answer that, and I called it unlocking deception. So take every thought captive by the exact Word of God. It's like a factory reset. Sometimes you think you're quoting Scripture right, and it's really good, but something about going to the Word as it's written, all the words put together there, it's like a spiritual factory reset to your soul. And you're looking at the perfect mirror of the word of the law of God. And in that, something happens to you that just doesn't happen any other way. So private reading of the word, public reading of the word, it will unlock deception and all these little things that you've seen trace all the way back to Gnosticism and what have you that get into our mind all the time and try to make it easier so we don't have to deal with the cross um, and, 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 and to refashion it to something that's not really true. Factory reset as the scripture is. It's not meant to be a verse over here and a verse over here to make your own doctrines. That, to me, is about as valuable as Gnosticism and dualism because that's not how the Word was written. You have to take every chapter and chapters and passages in context to realize how he was dealing with these people specifically and to see how does that may maybe apply to you personally so that you can take the Word for what it really does mean. Um, light and darkness, don't, they don't mix together. The light and darkness don't mix together. You can't find a serious Christian and one who's sliding into Gnosticism and thinking that they're gonna they're gonna be able to move together. Extreme compromise and extreme uh, um, a conviction. They can't move together. You can find some places to work together, but ultimately you'll find that stuff just doesn't add up. If you got one thing wrong, eventually you're gonna have another thing wrong, and you're gonna be kicking each other's heels, and that you can only go so far with them. So as far as I'm building my church, I'm building my church under the holiness doctrine. I'm going to build it under the church doctrine that is the best doctrine, biblical doctrine of that which is far from Gnosticism and totally in sound with the things that have bore the strongest fruit in church history. Amen. Um, I remember a long time ago, it was really, really helpful to help us as we were trying to like learn the wisdom about winning souls, something that I'm going to be trying to learn too, because I remember how I built the church originally. And all the people that used to come in the beginning, it was people that I helped out, people that I used to help move. I helped them with their home. I helped them with a lot of different stuff. And I was like, man, Lord, this is so hard. I couldn't even believe it. I never had, I just did it because it just kind of ended up naturally what had, actually ended up happening. But I did a lot of stuff for people and it, and it started the church and it, it was, uh, I was, I moved so many people, it wasn't even funny. It was just like, man, it was a really hard job. 
and sitting in the pulpit was about 1% of all that I had done to put that thing together. And, uh, but it was what it was really interesting. Um, I remember one time I was downtown and some girl had something in her eye and she didn't want to take a track and she didn't want to hear anything about Jesus because she had an issue and she didn't, she needed to resolve that issue. I got something in my eye right now. I don't want to talk about God right now. And I'm like, okay, you're going to go to hell. You know, that's what I was thinking about. But the truth is, um, when it comes to real living, um, I remember the teacher, like, when I first started going to college, like after high school, a long time ago, and the teacher said something very interesting. She said, a lot of people, they start going to college and then they quickly fall away. She says, because if your basic needs in your life are not met, you're not going to have the mind to study. You're not going to have the mind to go through all the follow through and to be successful long term for the, through the schooling. So a lot of people fall away and it's always the same thing. Your family is not in order. You're not comfortable with your family situation. You're not comfortable with your travels. You're not comfortable with your living situation. You're not comfortable with your community and your friendships and things like this. If anything, like these are not healthy, you're going to have a really hard time really concentrating and applying yourself to the extreme study that's going to be required to come here. And I was like, wow, that's really interesting. So when it comes to uh, he that winneth souls is wise, you're going to take that into consideration that there are going to be some people who lack in their needs, the basic needs, and the other people who have an abundance in their needs, they have more than they need, and so they don't want to care. I don't care. I got Jesus. I got Jesus left for you. You forgave me. And they're so careless with it because they got so much in their life. Other people are more, they don't have as much, so they're more, um, they need some help. And then now that they feel help, they feel more welcome. They feel more help. They got more relaxed. They got some needs met. And now they have a mind to listen to what might be um, being spoken and being trained in. So uh, that's a really good way to look at it. Never, it sounds pretty obvious, but it was kind of an eye-opener for me this week. Um, and being able to win souls and not trying to do it in any, any other crazy way, just out of the arm of the flesh, which I've seen a lot of people do. I've seen a lot of people who get famous, and it's just it's literally hilarious at how, how godless and how... Um, tactless or what do you want to call it people do all kinds of things in order to get attention and it seems to work pretty well it's it's kind of it's kind of scary um, to see that people use the arm of the flesh to get their to get their ministry started um, can't get someone saved until they know they're lost it's one of the things I remember Paris talking about is that a lot of times you can't even get an evangelical saved because you can't even convince them that they're not even really saved a lot of it's because of the Gnostic doctrines and I think Gnosticism and, and Dispensationalism have a lot in common, more than they probably think. And causing people to believe that they're saved before they actually have been born again. Where they have never had to deal with their sin. They've never had to deal, deal with their sin, past, present, and future. Because the Dispensationalist doctrine says that it's all been taken care of. Don't worry about any of that stuff. Even though Jesus and the Apostles never said anything like that, ever. They always talked about dealing with your past. You have all this stuff that's illegitimate. Go make restitution. Um, give all you give all you have to the poor, and you know, whatever. It was always extreme dealing. John the Baptist, said, what do I have to do to be saved? He said, give one of your coats to the poor. He always had some action to take because faith and works are so in union. And um, as a lot of people, they really haven't answered that call of sacrifice. They have never had to lose anything. They've never had to. Um, count the cost. They never realize how this is going to be an investment for my life to get to know the Lord for real. And so there's obviously two different spirits. One Jesus that doesn't cost anything and one Jesus that costs absolutely everything down to the nitty gritty, down to those little details. And so you can't get someone saved until they know that they're lost and that's what he wrote in his book in this book that I was showing you earlier about getting evangelicals saved or now it's called Evidences of Eternal Life. For whatsoever bor is born, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. It's one of the ways you can check and find out if you're really born again um, because the Gnostics weren't saved and so John was writing this book in order to help people see the difference of what it looks like when you're really born again. You really have, uh, you really believe in the Jesus that was raised in bodily form so you, now you know that he was flesh and now you cannot call flesh evil because your doctrine says that everything of matter is evil. That's why they would say, no, he was raised in the spirit. It was just the spirit of Christ. No, he was raised in bodily form thus proving that your doctrine is from the pit. So, everything born of the Father is going to overcome the ways of the world, the world system. We've got four different kind of worlds, we already know about those, but the world system and the way it operates, that you're going to be a part of their philosophy, and you can find that. You get around certain Christians that seem to be like you on certain pages, but overall you start to feel like their philosophy is really not of, the, of, of God, because it doesn't seem to have the same cost, doesn't have the same cross, and you don't feel like the same spirit, you don't feel, like this, you don't feel the same when you know you're really home at the house of God. And you hear them talking kind of the same, but all of a sudden they take some strange turns, proving that there's a difference and could be possibly that there, there could be the Gnostic Jesus and the true Jesus. The miracle doesn't have to happen anymore in the churches today. 
And so they, they don't even know that they're not even saved. And the miracle of rebirth doesn't have to happen. With the doctrines and the expectations of today's faith, they don't expect the new birth experience. They don't even expect to see it. They just want to see what they want to see a lot of times. As long as you go to church and try to be a good person, which even the Masons do that. The Luciferian Masons do that. There's a lot of people who do that, and they copy that same model with a different doctrine in all kinds of different Christian churches, and that is a very scary thing. They don't even, they won't listen. Like Charles Finney says, you can preach repentance to these people, but they've already been seared, in a sense, with a hot iron because these dangerous doctrines, making them think that everything's fine when they haven't even seen the cross for their own life. They have never been awakened to His righteousness. They don't allow the fear of God in their life because they think it's all done. They think, they mock it. They scoff at the very thing that can save them. The only thing that can save them is what they are tearing down as though it's utterly ridiculous. Some things just do come with reality of salvation. I mean, works will be different. The wanting for baptism like we're talking about, we have been trained to ignore the only thing that can save us. We've been trained in the American churches. The only thing that can save us is a serious, deep working of the Holy Spirit to let the kingdom of God know exactly what he thinks about you right where you're at. You know, some people are so broken they need to be comforted and that's okay, but ultimately there's going to be a cross for them to come to and there's going to be a mighty change led by the Holy Spirit, no doubt about that. If worldly entertainment doesn't make you sick, then yes, you are a backslider or you maybe never have been born again for real in the first place. But worldly entertainment is something that ought to look to your new life as as very, very not okay. It's not coming with me on my new journey. It should not make sense to you anymore. That's not new. That's a very old uh, understanding. During the Great Revivals, there's a lot of things that they never did anymore that people today would think was no big deal at all. It's a huge deal in God's economy. And if you don't be sober about these things, you're going to find yourself on the wrong side of the throne, dear church. Idols in our heart. When we are able to accept things in our life um, when it's not really the real deal. Um, sometimes we take we accept things in our life because it's better than nothing. It's kind of it's better than nothing. You know, I'd rather I'd rather have this in my life than than wait for the real thing. Um, they explain like this to mean truth, but when our hearts before the throne is really way off target, it's better it's better than nothing deception, even though we know it's wrong. That's a really really prominent prominent thing for people who don't want to wait. That's what happened to the folks at uh, Pentecost because Jesus revealed himself to over 500 people, and only how many showed up? Who, who was there for the final? Um, outpouring of the Holy Spirit, only 120. Most people didn't wait for the final production. And there's a sense, it's a sense like that. There's a lot of folks who've been called to know more than just the, the beginning stages of Christianity or even Christianity at all. There's a lot of different things that can happen in the real walk of God. Let's just assume that they aren't even born again and they don't wait for the move of the Holy Spirit. They come, oh, I went, I went to church, everything was fine. I, I went with everybody else and most people left and a couple people stayed a little later and that's good, but we were all there. And they don't see the difference because that miracle has never happened. Christianity is a miracle. Christianity is a miracle. And if your doctrine is has not let if your Christian doctrine has not allowed you to come to the miracle of conversion unto Jesus Christ by the power of God, your doctrine is not Christian. It is more like Gnosticism, which Jesus says he hates. They need him more. Oh, this is another one about kind of like putting things in perspective about folks who are in other nations who are extremely poor. Now that I'm on Facebook, I've got a lot of friends that are very, very poor. And it's really been on my heart to like, well, Lord, how do I help these folks? Because there's a little bit that can help them. Because I remember my dad, he went over to uh, Sri Lanka after they had a tsunami hit like quite a long time ago, like way over, about over 10 years ago. And he says that he sends $35 a month to this one pastor. And he says that's like a month salary to them. He says that they make such terrible money. And I saw some stuff about like uh, a lot of hits against Nike. There's a lot of controversy going on about Nike, about one thing, and I found some stuff about sweatshops and stuff like that, where people who actually make these shoes that are like up to $800 a pair of shoes, and these folks who make them, they only make $1.25 or $1.80 an hour, a, a day, a day. So they, they make nothing, they can barely survive, they're living on dirt floors, their, their living situation is, is so bad. It is so bad. It makes the shed that we haven't finished in the back look like paradise compared to what they live in. It's utterly unbelievable. So um, I bet it's been on my heart to think like, man, Lord, I, they need you more. It's like we need you like the air we breathe over here, but we have so much. We are so blessed over here. We have roofs over our heads. We have clean water. We have a lot of things that we that they don't have any of that. They don't even have clean water. They have to drink out of, some of these places have to drink out of, a water where pigs are swimming in and they have worms in their skin because that's the best water that they can get. It's very, very bad. 
And so I'm like, God, how do I help him? Because I don't want to be scammed by someone who's pretending to be a pastor out there. Because I'd like, I'd like to really help real people and with their real need. And I think we ought to. The Bible says that we're supposed to reach out and help people when we have the, when we have the means. They need him more. Yes, we have needs for God, but they need him more than we do. And we ought to be praying for them and trying to find a way to um, at least a, a couple dollars. I thought about raising up a thousand people on Facebook and say, everybody, could you all give a dollar? In one month, we're going to raise up a thousand dollars, and I'm going to give to ten different pastors a hundred dollars. That'll be like a two-month, three-month uh, salary for each one of these guys. That's going to be like huge, a big a boost for them to kind of take care of their medical bills. They can take care of their hurts and needs and put some repairs to their churches or whatever, their homes. Their homes, it's like a piece of metal and a, a, some sticks. I mean, it's really bad. So, and that's for real. And I've seen it more than just on Facebook. I've seen it on many different sources. It's very, very real. The people, it's extremely poor. They can barely eat. And when they do eat, they eat like a cup full of like porridge. Every meal, it's like just porridge. I mean, I can't even, I can't even, use, I can stand eating a sandwich every day. It's so boring to eat a thing of porridge, and that's all you eat. Can't even fork it and nothing. They have churches. They're sitting on dirt floors. That's how they sit on the floor everywhere they go are concrete floors, and that's their service. They're very poor, and I think God's expecting us to to look at that and to see how can we honestly do it where it's going to go, where the where the money is going to go in the right hands because they need it more than we do. Things I've learned in the last little while. I've talked about relationships. Oh yeah, and also the um, the hard to focus on things when your life is not in order. So those are a couple of things that we can keep in mind while trying to win souls, is to try to make sure we're we're planting seeds more than trying to win them over to Jesus and make sure they they give up everything and all that stuff. Because the things that really last, we want to see lasting fruit in their life, and we got to be merciful when good on one on one. You get personal with them. You all of us, we all need to be treated like this. I want to be treated like this. Other folks need to be treated like this. Think of the, about the things that they need in their life and want those things for them. Honestly, want them. You want what you want in your life. You want your own dignity. You want, you want your own needs met. You have to want that for everybody else. That's what loving your neighbor is all about. Honestly, caring. Do you have these things in your life? Like, honestly, care. Maybe we can team up and network and see if we can start get some ground going on here and help them with these things because it's, it's important. It's a really important relationships. Uh, they call it, I call it the crock pot of being stripped right now. It's like, well, really, God is really all I feel like I have right now. It feels like it's a really good chance to really cleanse the, the temple, so to speak, and really refocus. Uh, and, and, and I'm doing pretty good. I'm, I'm really laying hold and listening to the Lord, what He wants me to think about. And I feel like He's telling me to build the house church and to really contemplate um, my, my sins in my past and to really look at them and see how things have crept in analyze it think about it intricately and very radically 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 commit righteous um, plans and commitments to God and that's what I did last night I said every little thing I'm gonna watch over like a hawk nothing like this will ever go on no little um, appearances of evil nothing like this you know I know I never have lived in sin for 13 years I've had some mistakes but I've never plan on living in sin. I've never said this is how it's going to be from now on. No, it's it's been very tricky, but I've, I've realized that with extreme discipline, God starts to move. You start to say, Lord, I'm going to meet you right here. This is how I'm going to roll. Then he's going to start to impart himself in the next seasons ahead to show you how he honors that. He wants you to say yes to strong, holy living. And we want to see these things happen for all of our relationships to be right and keep our focus on right, all of our basic needs coming into order and wanting all these things for other folks as well. Israel is a huge focus, as it always is, and I was thinking about this as we're looking at the end times closing in on us. Um, we still haven't seen the temple fully built, but it's there. Um, there's enough um, material there and a lot of things kind of leading that direction. But um, I was thinking about how, how in the world the, the world is going to have to look at Israel like they're the biggest problem of the world. You know, it seems like it's so easy to brainwash the world because they're just so easily manipulated. And to make Israel look monstrous is so easy because everybody watches the news and they actually think it's telling the truth, which is, is, is borderline hysterical, that people can actually fall for this kind of stuff. But they're going to all have to wish him to be dead to imagine all these armies being led that direction. They're going to be led to go and destroy God's number one people. With the most popular book in the world says don't touch them, and they're all going to be led to touch them because they're going to be looking at Scripture under such a different light. The twisting of Scripture today is, a, is bad, and it's going to get much worse. 
Are you think this is bad? People are talking about the scripture in such inconceivable lights, coming up with the just most hideous conclusions, proving that they do not know about the miracle of born-again experience and salvation. If you have it, all you want to do is just be around God. All you want to do is just do His blessed will. You want to be around people of God. You want to be around strong families, strong Christians. You want to do things in a pure, holy way. But no, the twisting of scripture to make the whole world think Israel, who is a good thing that needs to be protected because he's going to be bringing everlasting righteousness through them, and now you're going to be saying, oh, they're the biggest issue. You're listening to the wrong spirit. While we were yet sinners, he commended his love toward us. Christ died, but while we continued sinning, he commended his wrath toward us, and then we died. Amen. So we can look at it both ways. God doesn't just commend his love constantly. He commends his love because while we were, we were sinners, he committed his love and paid for this thing so we can stop living that way, stopping sin indefinitely, radically, whip it out of your life like Jesus whipped the sin out of the temple and whipped all the money changers out of there. Whip out the sin that radically or more and until you start to see this thing so you don't have to have him commend his wrath for us where we do the dying. Because if we don't die to our flesh and our will, we we're, we're going to die in, in, in hell forever. A uh, really interesting thing I thought, i never seen this in Revelation 17, 17. I'm actually going to read it verbatim from the scriptures, Revelation 17, 17. Another place where it's talking about him working his will in, because I like to get things dialed in where you can see all the scriptures that do uh, put this together here. Um, whenever you have a different topic, I like to see a lot of different scriptures that will th th help um, embrace it and define it further. For God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. It's pretty interesting. He's going to get them to want to give their kingdom unto the beast. So God's going to be working this into this thing. This is talking about the whore of Babylon, which is obviously going to be connected to Rome. I don't know how much Rome it is, but uh, you see him working his will in here. There's another place where you're like, how can that ever be? Because God puts it in you to happen. Like, they can harden Pharaoh's heart. Why did he harden Pharaoh's heart? Because Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Why would God put this trash into their heart? Because they already put that trash in their heart on their own. They're the whore of Babylon. you got to follow the right woman, the woman that is going to be uh, God's true people. It was Israel before, now the new woman is the, is the bride of Christ, and now the, old, the other woman is the whore of Babylon. And a lot of people are following that, thinking they're following the real Christ because they're listening to the doctrines that are twisted, either dispensationalism, Gnosticism, dualism, antinomianism, or something other, some other heresy beyond all description like this, twisting of scripture. Oh, I'm going to read another one from verbatim, too, in Revelation 18. Listen to this scripture. It's actually another scripture helping prove to people that Rome is the headquarters of hell. Whenever you hear that script, whenever you hear that phrase about all roads lead to Rome, this is actually a really good one. When you're thinking about all the roads lead to uh, Rome as far as... Uh... Oh, here it is. The, last, the very last verse in Revelation 18, which is still talking about the whore of Babylon. And in her, the whore of Babylon, which I believe is Rome, was found the blood of prophets and of saints, and of all that were slain upon the earth. Now, we know that Rome itself is not the one going around killing people. You don't see the Pope out there killing everybody and saying, that was me. No, he doesn't make it that simple. He raises up other groups to do so. So all these groups that are out there killing Christians and killing the saints and killing God's people, people who won't submit to this system, whether it's godly people or they're not, um, they're getting whacked out, and ultimately you're going to trace it right back to Rome. I believe that that Rome, Revelation 18, verse 24 in here was found all the blood from all all blood that ultimately came from Rome. That's what I believe that's saying right there. The only thing we own in this world is what? Our will. We're temporary governors over the things in our lives. That's all we are. We're temporary governors. We only own one thing, your will. That's the one thing you're going to take with you forever. Everything else will pass. Heaven and earth will pass. Your body will be going back to the dust. And what you did with your will is the only thing you can do when that fully is released to God, His Spirit will become yours and you will have a brand new life in Jesus Christ to know all the things that are assumed and you're going to want to grow in that legitimately. Consider it to be organically, like you've got to climb a tree, then you actually have to get yourself up that tree. Oh, I don't have the right gloves. We'll go buy the gloves and get up there legitimately, whatever it takes to actually do the job. Um, do I preach work salvation? Yes. <laughs> It's going to lose all my subscribers. But Jesus preached work salvation. James did. He says, faith without works is dead. So not ultimately, we're not saved by works itself, but works cannot not be there. They have to be there too. It's just part of the package. It's like, if you don't breathe, you don't have any air in your lungs, you're going to be dead. 
Does breathing keep you alive? I don't know how it's so simple. People just twist some scripture. I believe Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, that by grace are we saved, not of works. I believe that verse right there is going to destroy millions of souls because they don't take it in context for what it really means. Read the whole Bible and you're going to see God is commanding us to get busy. What you've done in your body will determine what you whether you're going to go to heaven or hell. So don't tell me works are not a part of it. Works are a part of it. Only thing we own in this world is our will. We're temporary governors of it. God expects us to do right with our, with our time that we hear. Um, another people want to like prove that uh, preach that uh, another one of these terrible doctrines that I believe is going to damn a lot of souls is the pre-tribulation rapture doctrine that we've talked about before, and one of the things that they use in order to say that that can happen is that the first seven seals is the wrath of God, which is absolutely not true. The first seven seals is not the wrath of God. Um, the sixth seal is where the people act, the, the heathen are saying the wrath of God has come, but it hasn't come. It hasn't come yet. Doesn't happen, it won't actually happen for two more chapters, and there's several things that have to happen in between the two. They say it's coming because something happens, and as soon as it goes away, then they say peace and, peace and safety. So don't tell me that they are going to say, oh, this is the wrath. Well, just because the heathen said it doesn't mean anything. They're the ones who are living in la-la land, and to the sinners, the whoremongers, and the manslayers, behold, I come as a thief to those sinners. Christians are not in darkness, they are in righteousness, and they will know when Jesus is coming back. Real Christians know what science to look for. There's two things the Bible talks about when it comes to that. They're going to count the number of the beast because they have understanding. Let him who hath understanding count the number of the beast. And for those that are real Christians, they're going to be watching and waiting for what? The true biblical signs of the return of Jesus Christ. The first seven seals are not the wrath of God. Do not try to pull that one over me. Jesus himself says these are the beginning of sorrows. That's not the wrath of God. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven, not on earth. Amen. Uh, 1 John, another, uh, the Spirit in 1 John, I never said this before, it's another place in the Bible where it says that the Spirit of God shall teach you all things. It says about the Spirit of God, calls him an it, and it also calls him a him. Interesting, huh? It comes to what the Bible calls pneumatology. Pneumatology is the doctrines of the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. 1 John, in one verse, I didn't write the verse down, but it, another place where it says that the Spirit shall teach you all things, that you need not a man to teach you, because the Spirit of God shall teach you all things. It's another place here, 1 John as well, it and him, the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. They went out from us because they were not of us. Anybody could teach that doctrine and say that's because we're right, they left us because we're right and they're wrong. Anybody could say that, but here's the ultimate point. Another thing about Gnosticism, they went out from us because they're Gnostic. They went out because they're not obedient. They were disobedient to God's gospel. God is going to come with flaming fire and vengeance against all those who know not God. Why don't they know God? Because they haven't given His will and they obey not the gospel. If you think you can go to heaven without obeying the gospel, you are a damnable heretic. You are not a Christian. You are leading people to hell and you're going to go to bust hell wide open with your rebellious, wicked doctrines that came from Plato and came from Gnosticism and God, God hating people, perverted people, rapists pedophiles, whatever you're thinking like that, but that is so far from the truth of God, and these are the wicked people who are preaching this trash. You have to obey God. You've always had to obey God, justified by faith, unto His law, unto His Holy Word, unto His Holy Spirit, or you're not Christian. That's why they went out from us, because they were disobedient. One-liner in the streets, another thing I thought was really interesting, the scripture that Jesus is preaching about um, when a little one stumbles. It says, if you cause one of my little ones to stumble, it would be better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck and cast into the sea. That's what the Bible says. That's what Jesus said. So for people, just them living in sin is going to cause them to go to hell. There's no question about that. But their influence, especially the more influential you are, the more prideful you are, the more people look at you and are influenced and they do what you do and you know that you have influence on other people, it's going to cause a lot of folks to stumble. People who are trying to seek God and they saw your influence, you distracted them from the will of God and they messed up, they capsized, they're going to go to hell, but you're going to go to hell. It says it would be better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck and cast into the sea. I mean, just utter horror is nothing compared to what Jesus says he's going to do to you. Amen. So another thing we can do, like girls want to dress immodestly in the streets. Hey, everybody who you cause to stumble, sister, you're going to be giving an account to God. It says it's be better that you had a millstone tied around your neck and cast into the sea than what God is going to do to you girls, okay? you got to sober up. I know you've been through a lot. Who hasn't? Okay, stop using excuses. Um, there's a lot. I saw this guy had a really good thing. as a pastor out in Africa, and he had a long list. He says um, Zacchaeus was really short, so he couldn't use that as an excuse, but God called him. There was another guy. Uh, I forgot all the lists, all these things that people use as excuses, and he was going down the list of showing you biblical characters 
who were that, and they actually got on target with God. They're, they can get rid of that excuse, can get rid of that excuse, going down the list. Pretty hilarious. So, no, no distractions. Um, no, no, don't use any of these kind of things like this. It's not all right. Worldly movies is being embraced by the church with philosophy. The church is full of philosophy, sexual perversion, murder, and distractions, etc. These are the things that we don't want in our life. And I don't want people to think it's alright to sit there and watch a movie and invite that into your house. No man shall be held guiltless who taketh his name in vain. You will not be guilt-free, you'll be guilty if you stand before him and you let that come out of your mouth. You blaspheme the name of the Lord and that comes out of your mouth. Well, I didn't do it, but you put the DVD in there and you have a big screen. You filled your home up with blasphemy of God's name. You blaspheme the name that saves you. You blaspheme, you, you deny him with your works, you deny him with your lips, you praise him, praise you, Lord, you go home and watch, you pay some Illuminati sellout, uh, somebody who had uh, who was sexually perverse, a lot of these people who get into this industry, they had to sell themselves to Mr. Creepy um, d Director, and that's what you're financing, that's what you've invited into your home, whether it be the music department, uh, arts, or the whatever, all these things, there's a lot of creepy junk that has to go on for them to make it that big, and you had to buy that thing and watch them do the evil things that they do, and you call yourself a Christian as you blaspheme his holy name in your house. That is not okay. Don't do it anymore. Chop it off. Chop off your hand, chop off your eye to the saving of your soul. All in the bag. That's another thing I think is one we're going to end with this right here. All in the bag. I've fallen for this too before. Where you think some things are just there and nothing could ever go wrong. It's not true. Every good thing, it needs to be fed continually. It needs to be worked on continually. Protected and fed. Um, they are not just expected... They're not just an expected blessing. You can't just expect to just assume things that are good in your life, people that come in your life. Um, consider them all to be blessed. I remember John Bevere did that one time. God took him through the ringer for a long time and let him be under a tremendous amount of suffering. And he went out to the hills and just cried out to God and says, God, why are you letting me go through all this? He says, because when I start bringing people into your life, I want you to treat them good. I want, I'm going to bring some workers to help you with your ministry, and I want you to treat them really good, because right now you're not in the character to do so. I have to burn this out of you. With much suffering brings produces righteousness, the Bible says. So God, if he's really raising you up for real, he's going to take you through a lot of heavy weather, not on accident. Think it not strange that these diverse things happen to you. God's got a good call for your life. He's got a good spirit he wants to put on you. He's going to put a good vision inside of you. He's going to put his blessed Holy Spirit. He's going to make that thing that he called you years ago and make it a fruition reality as you start to agree with the kingdom truth and what it really takes long term. Inviting everybody else in so you can connect with him rightly. He doesn't want to set you up for failure. So I'm not going to release you yet. <laughs> I'll trust you with more. As soon as you can be a master of this, I'll be making you a ruler over much many, might many more. But God wants to do this for us for real. You don't think of it's all in the bag. It's not like that. It never will be. Life is complicated. Life is very messy. But he wants to put an authority and a spirit inside of you so you can handle things in a legitimate way that will be a profitable and not injurious. You know, um, My mouth needs to be careful because I've been uncaref uncareful with my mouth and has caused useless divisions. Um, that's not the only kind of divisions that have happened, but there's been other ones that, need to, that sh I should be watching out for. Let's see what else we got here. Yeah. I remember this happened to another guy. This, I'll just tell you one story. This just, just happened. I just got a phone call about a gentleman who was um, training for the ministry and obviously fell into sin. And so he got kicked out of uh, the training for ministry and got kicked out of the church. And he got kicked out of... Um, now he's, he's going to be getting kicked out of his free living situation too. Uh, free food, etc. Everything was kind of connected. And he was living there and he was being careful. Like, oh, it's all in the bag. You know, I've got to be a minister and and let your guards down and all this stuff. Uh, church, don't ever let your guards down. The Bible says that that's equal to being perishing. It says that where there's only you lack the holy vision, when you lack vision, people perish. Or the new version said that they cast off restraints. We have to restrain ourselves from doing things that is wrong. God calls us to do so. We, gotta, we, got, we have to do it right. Some people, oh, that's your works, works of your flesh then, isn't it, brother? <laughs> it's like whatever you want to call it, just do it right. Amen. We have to love the Lord our God with our own strength, our own heart, our own might, and our own will. Amen. Which is the thing that belongs to us, but we want to give it to God every day and die to ourselves. Father, we love you, and we do want to give you our will every day, God, and we want it to be fruitful, and we want it to be filled with your heavenly light, God, that there will be genuine worship in our life and in our hearts, God. And Father, we, we want the easy truth, God. We want the exciting truth. We want to talk about all the great things that can happen, Lord, but we also want to be ambassadors that want to get behind the scenes and to do the real dirty work, Lord, too. 
We want to be a military Lord to endure hardness as a good soldier, uh, ready to be pleasing to our master, Father. We want to be pleasing to you, dear Most High God. And may we be pleasing in your sight, Lord, if there is uh, sin among your people, Lord God, that really want to be free. I pray that you would deliver them, Lord. I pray that you would uh, reach out to them and apply thy blood um, to make them blessed, Lord God. Call them out, Lord, so they will be able to see uh, the, the step way out. That, that's uh, your pleasing way, God. And uh, to set them free from the bondage of sin, Lord God. For those that really want to do it right, I pray that you would set them free. So I pray, Lord, uh, that tonight would be a, sign, a, a time of worship, a time of just uh, getting away, and uh, that we can fellowship tonight, Lord, and just to uh, be with each other and to praise you, God. And uh, I pray that you'd help us to know how to build this church and to make a great difference that would be in unity, Father, uh, among your people, that we would love one another, that we would love you, God, with our life and our disciplines. and. Our life would look like a soul that is set apart for your blessed will. So may your name get glory in this house. In Jesus' blessed name, amen. Amen. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. Day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Compassionate friend, he met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling, he made all the darkness depart. Oh, heaven came down and glory filled my soul. My soul, when at the cross the Savior made me whole, and my sins were washed away. from above into God's family divine justified fully through Calvary's love oh what a standing is mine and the transaction so quickly was made when as a sinner I came took of the offer of grace he did proper save me oh praise his dear name oh heaven came down and glory my soul, my soul, and at the cross the Savior made me whole, and my sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day, when heaven came down and glory filled my soul, now I have a hope that will surely endure, after the passing of time, I have a future in heaven for sure. There in those mansions sublime, man is because of that wonderful day. What at the cross I believe, riches eternal and blessed, supernal and precious. From his precious hand I received. Oh, heaven came down and glory filled my soul. My soul, when at the cross the Savior made me whole. And my sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. When heaven came down and glory filled my soul.
you do? You got, um, you got, uh, I do love to tell a story about you and your interaction with me, God, and how much more we are we going to learn when we actually get to glory, God. And God, uh, thank you um, for your word and help it to grow in us and, mm -hmm. and bear you fruit, God, and um, help us to grow in fellowship and in love as your uh, will uh, commands, God and allows and ask a blessing on the rest of the night and on um, the food and fellowship and we love you so much in Jesus name God we pray Amen, Amen. Amen.